Okay, so thanks everyone again for joining us this morning. My name is Emily Vale. I'm the executive director of the Hudson River Watershed Alliance. As Russell mentioned, I've been in this role now for the past three years. I'm really excited to be sharing with you the Hudson River Watershed Alliance's Watershed Needs Assessment. So today's talk, we'll go through some background and context for this project. We'll talk a little bit about what a watershed group is and now how we defined watershed groups for the purposes of this project. I'll go through our methodology for the needs assessment study and then share the, the report and the appendix, uh, the format that we're, we're presenting this information in. I'll go through some key findings and themes, both things that we expected, that we heard, and also some surprises talk about next steps and actions, and then open up the floor for Q&A. So the needs assessment is available on the Hudson River Watershed Alliance's website. And so if anyone has, has read it and has uh, thoughts or questions, you know, we really encourage uh, not only from the talk, but if you if you had a chance to take a look and there's things that surprised you, you know, we're really looking forward to your feedback as well. So the Hudson River Watershed Alliance is a regional nonprofit. Our mission is to unite and empower communities to protect their local water resources. And we do this by supporting watershed groups, improving intermunicipal coordination, and working to communicate as a collective voice on water issues throughout the region. We do this through a variety of education and capacity building programs like workshops, like the one pictured here, uh, that used to be in person. Of course, now we're doing everything via Zoom. Our monthly breakfast lectures, which uh, you're, you're at one right now, our annual watershed conference and watershed roundtables. So all of these programs focus on providing science-based information, helping groups with capacity building, uh, providing opportunities for networking and connecting people with resources. So the Hudson River watershed extends from Lake Tier of the Clouds in the Adirondacks all the way down to New York City. And its watershed, the land area that flows to that common water body is about 13,400 square miles. It includes the Upper Hudson watershed, the Mohawk River watershed, and the Hudson River estuary watershed. And of course, each of these watersheds have hundreds of tributary streams that contribute to the health and the ecosystem of the Hudson River. So while we're working across a very large scale, we're also really concerned at what's going on at the local scale and really depend on watershed groups and other local partners to help do local water resource protection to benefit the entire system. So what is a needs assessment? A needs assessment is a process to identify and document unmet needs, gaps in services, or problems in a community. And it's often used to help prioritize programs. And that was certainly the case for, for this needs assessment project. This work was designed to look at regional watershed groups, talk with both watershed groups and regional partners to guide the strategy and curricula for future capacity building and educational events. So what is a watershed group? We've defined watershed groups as community-based groups working to protect local water bodies within the Hudson River watershed using a watershed framework and scale. And this map is, is cropped. Uh, apologies to the Mohawk Watershed Alliance and the folks in the upper Hudson watershed. Uh, we've got some groups up there as well. But just to give you a sense of some of the watershed groups across the region and the areas where they're working. So I think what really sets these groups apart is that rather than looking at municipal boundaries exclusively um, or other geographic delineations, they're really looking at watersheds at the scale to manage water and to think about our, our communities. So watershed groups are community-based initiatives. They're really grounded in local work. Many of them are volunteer run. We also have several intermunicipal councils that have participation and leadership by municipalities. Some watershed groups are led by agencies or nonprofits, or they have staff support from those groups. They're really known for their local knowledge of their watershed and the ways in which they advocate for its health. And obviously collaboration is key, and that'll be a theme throughout this presentation. In terms of the kinds of things that watershed groups do, uh, they often convene stakeholders, coordinate projects, educate residents, promote stewardship through activities like stream cleanups or tree plantings, they monitor water quality, they partner with scientists and academic institutions on research projects, and they also create watershed plans. 
Again, overall, they're taking a watershed approach. Watershed groups take on many different forms, roles, and structures. There's really a diversity across the region of how these groups have organized themselves and the kinds of roles that they play and the structures that they take. And that reflects their diverse strengths, accomplishments, and needs. So speaking of accomplishments, um, in 2020, the Hudson River Watershed Alliance produced our work on watersheds report. Uh, I've got my, my copy right here. And this document compiles success stories from 32 watershed groups working on Hudson River tributaries. And it's available on our website. If you haven't had a chance to take a look, highly recommend that you go to that site and, and download the PDF. And the work on watersheds was a part of the needs assessment project. And so through our interviews and conversations, we were able to highlight the strengths and accomplishments of many of these watershed groups. And, and the goal of the work on watersheds was to really show the diversity of different roles, the diversity of different accomplishments. So, oh, let's see. So a couple uh, spreads here, just to give you a sense of what the, water, the work on watersheds report looks like. Um, got the watershed group, some photos, some stories, and some highlights for each one. All right, so, uh, so back to the needs assessment. So in terms of our methodology, this project was really a collaboration with Dr. Michael Finewood, who's the chair and associate professor at the Department of Environmental Studies and Science at Pace University, and also a Hudson River Watershed Alliance board member. So huge thanks uh, to Mike to help really frame this project and have really rigorous methods with a focus on qualitative social science methodology. So this natural scientist learned a lot about uh, social science research methods over the course of this project. So the way that we gathered information for the needs assessment was first through semi-structured one-on-one interviews with 32 watershed group leaders from 28 different watershed groups. And those took place between November 2019 and March 2020. After we went through those interviews, we later had a series of four focus group meetings with groups of regional partners. And our focus groups focused on municipalities, academics, and regional nonprofits and agencies. Those took place uh, via Zoom between March and April of 2021. So in total, we spoke with 56 different people throughout this project. All participant information has been kept confidential, which you'll see uh, in the report. And each of these conversations were recorded and transcribed. So in terms of the, the types of people that we interviewed, again, everyone has been kept confidential, but our interview participants represented leaders of active groups, people that we consider local champions. They might be the point person for their particular watershed, really championing this work at a watershed scale. They were also leaders of groups that were more active in the past, but had really important insights to share with us. They included volunteers, staff from agencies and nonprofit organizations, municipal officials, college and university faculty and staff, and more. And these folks were directly involved with watershed groups. Our focus groups represented municipalities, including counties, academic institutions and scientists, and regional organizations. And these were people that worked both directly and indirectly with watershed groups. And it was really helpful to get some outside perspectives as well on what some of the perceived needs, strengths, and so on were from that group. So again, each of these conversations were recorded and transcribed. We coded the transcripts going line by line to identify individual answers to our questions. We sorted the codes into themes. And here you can see, this is a copy of the code book that we used to, to work through this process. And this process allowed us to look across all of the different uh, interviews, focus group conversations, and ide identify common needs, barriers, challenges, strengths, and accomplishments across all of these conversations. Um, we also pulled out certain themes. So it gives you a sense of, of this process. If you're interested in these methods in more detail, We've included the specific questions for both the interviews and the focus groups in the needs assessment uh, report. So after all of this work, uh, we've landed with 
two different products. So the needs assessment report is a report out of all of the information that we heard from interview and focus group participants. All of the content came directly from participants and is not based on Hudson River Watershed Alliance interpretation. And that's one question that I've, I've gotten. Uh, did people really say this? Are you thinking that this is what they meant? And, and we tried to really be as, as honest and, and truthful in reporting out what we heard without interpreting that information. So the report is about 45 pages. It's available on our website. We also developed an appendix to go along with the report. So the appendix is uh, about 200 pages of direct quotations from participants organized by theme. And it really provides rich detail on the specific challenges, barriers, needs, strengths, or accomplishments within the report. So the needs assessment appendix really is not designed to be read front to back. The report, you absolutely could do that. The appendix really is designed to be a database where you can query specific questions. And we'll go through an example of that now. But before I do that, uh, just a couple of disclaimers. All watershed groups have both strengths and needs. So we heard from every single group that they have strengths. We heard from every single group that they have needs and not every need in the needs assessment is shared across all watershed groups. So just because it appears in here, it doesn't mean it's across every single group that we talked to, but in many cases it, it was shared, right? We heard common themes uh, in many ways. So the watershed needs assessment includes information on strengths, accomplishments, structures, and so on. Um, but it really focuses on the challenges, barriers, and needs. And the work on watersheds report focuses on the strengths and accomplishments. So they're really two sides of the same coin and I wanna emphasize that. And again, watershed groups have a real impact and with support, they can do even more. And so in, as we're looking at the needs, I think it's important to remember that they're already doing great work. They're already accomplishing so much. And if these needs are met, I think we can leverage even more great outcomes. So, I'll be sharing a couple quotes throughout this process of one of the things about having these transcripts is that we can hear directly from watershed groups some of their thoughts. Um, I'll read this one. So it's interesting how the positives and negatives kind of go hand in hand. With the leadership that's been in place for so long, there might be a sense of comfort in that. So there's not necessarily that new leadership that's stepping up to fill the gap. I would say that is probably our number one challenge right now, just because the future of this group relies on having some form of leadership group, and that's somewhat in question right now. So I really like this quote because it shows that a strength, so this group has had really strong leadership over time, can also be a challenge because there's an issue with getting new leadership to step up and thinking about planning for leadership transitions. So uh, when you open up the needs assessment report, the first section is a summary of findings. This is a two page summary of a lot of the information that we heard. We tried to pull out some of the more cross cutting uh, bullets of, of the needs uh, so that if you don't have time, if you're just interested in hitting the highlights, uh, you can check out what some of those are. We've also got some information on the project background uh, as well in this section. So then you'll come to the table of contents, which goes through the overview, our methods, some information about watershed group forms and functions, watershed group motivations and goals, issues in the watersheds themselves. And then the group challenges, barriers and needs focuses on the issues that the watershed groups are facing. So separating out the geographic challenges from the group challenges. Uh, we've got strengths, accomplishments, some opportunities, um, and, and some concluding remarks. Uh, so just to take you through, walk you through how you might use the needs assessment report, you might be particularly interested in leadership. You can come to the table of contents. It's all clickable and linked within the document, and you can pull up the leadership section. So You'll find at the top of each section a couple of quotes. There's that one that, that I had just read. And then some paragraphs describing um, in a really dense way uh, the feedback and, and what we heard from groups. So you might be reading through this paragraph, OK, leadership, great. And you might get to this section, planning for leadership transitions is a challenge. And that was something that we just heard in that quote. 
So if you're interested in more information on that, you can come to the appendix. So this is the appendix table of contents, which is also linked, and it's organized in the same way that the report is with more detail. So you can come over to this section on leadership and click on leadership transitions and pull up all of these different quotes with some uh, of our analysis summarizing that information that explains really what is it about leadership transitions that's the challenge. And I think that for, for some of these specific questions, for some of these specific projects, going right to the source and, and hearing directly from these watershed groups and focus group participants can be really, really powerful. So I encourage you to, to use the appendix in that, in that way and, and not to read front to back. So I'm gonna walk us through some of our key findings and themes, and I'm gonna start with what things that we heard that we expected. So these were not necessarily surprises. So in terms of challenges, barriers, and needs, which is sort of the focus of, of this section, we heard from almost everybody about the challenge of limited capacity. So capacity is the ability to meet challenges and enhance strengths in the face of uncertainty. And we heard from watershed groups, regional partners, you know, kind of across the board that time and resources are limited for this work and they wish they could do more with more time, more funding and more participation. So we heard that funding was a need that was not surprising. And in terms of the types of funding needs, we heard about staff, the need to, to hire staff and contractors, um, even groups that are currently supported with staff from agencies or, or nonprofits needed more staff or staff that could really focus on watershed group work, um, contractors to provide support, funding for operations, which could be you know, office space, but it also could be insurance and printing and all kinds of other operations based costs and then project costs as well. So we heard a lot about the cost of water quality monitoring uh, implementation projects and so on. Many of the people we talked to also expressed the need for more participation and members, so just more people to get involved. More things that uh, we expected to hear, um, leadership, defining goals and setting priorities, organization and structure, so how to really build the watershed group in such a way to meet the goals, and then communication as well, so communication about the watershed group and about watershed conditions. And looking through this list, um, you might notice that these are really common challenges, barriers, and needs uh, for all kinds of organizations. So many of these were not specific to watershed groups, um, but they are generally needs of many organizations that are working on these kinds of issues. And, and certainly I can empathize with a lot of these with the Hudson River Watershed Alliance as well, um, thinking about our capacity as well. So here, here's a quote from an interview participant that I think summed up these some of these issues really well. So this person wrote, we still need a lot of time and support to build a framework for our operation that is more stable and can start to bring more people in. I think that is the easiest thing to say is right now is some form level of formalizing the roles that we've been playing. So this person was noting that although there was interest in their watershed group, there were people that wanted to get involved, without having a framework and sort of an organizational structure and roles for those people, they were having challenges uh, getting those people involved, engaged and sort of rowing in the same direction. And so the, there's the time, there's the support, funding, getting back to capacity, organizational structure. Um, and so a lot of these things are very interwoven um, and the needs sort of interact with each other. So some surprises. So these were th three things that surprised me. And again, if you've gone through the needs assessment and you've seen things that surprise you, uh, very interested in hearing your feedback. So uh, I was surprised to hear that technical training was not always a priority, that implementation projects were not necessarily within the purview of watershed groups, though they play important roles in moving implementation projects forward and that emerging watershed issues and the scale of these issues may require new roles for watershed groups. So I'll go through each of these in more detail. So we asked each interview participant, do you feel like you or your group is lacking in technical skills? And I was very surprised that about a third of our participants said no. 
they said, we're actually not lacking in technical skills. We are fine in that regard. We have all these other needs. And this was really interesting to me. I, you know, I would have expected everyone to say, yes, we have technical training needs. Uh, in many ways, the Hudson River Watershed Alliance's mission is to to provide technical information to watershed groups. So, so that was surprising for me to hear. But what was so interesting to learn is that the people who felt like they had the technical skills they needed were in partnership with a variety of different experts to provide that knowledge. So this was really a strength for many watershed groups. And they were in partnership with scientists, soil and water conservation districts, other county agencies, municipal staff, and others that could pr provide the technical skills that they needed. So even some of the volunteer groups uh, had members that had expertise and they had partners that provided expertise that really helped meet those needs. So here's a quote from, from one of those people. I don't feel like we need we lack technical skills. We have such a diverse group that it's like if we need advice on managing invasive species, we ask a certain partner. If we need advice on ag, we ask a certain partner. If we need advice on forestry, we ask a certain partner. If we need advice on urban issues, we ask a certain partner. It's because of the nature of the counties and the diverse nature of the watershed as a whole. There's a wealth of knowledge when you get the group together. And so I think this speaks to the strength of coalition building that that watershed groups play that particular role in, in convening experts with lots of different background to support this kind of watershed work. So that's not to say that technical expertise is not a need. Uh, again, two thirds of groups did say that it was a need and we broke out those needs into a couple different categories. So we did hear about scientific or technical skills that were needed like water quality monitoring, GIS, geographic information systems and understanding land use processes in more detail. There were organizational skills like leadership, group management and coordination, fundraising and grant writing, and communication skills uh, for outreach and education, for lobbying, website and social media, and also diversity, equity, and inclusion work. So, in terms of implementation projects, what we heard was that municipalities and soil and water conservation districts in particular are very active in implementing construction projects. And here we're thinking about larger scale uh, infrastructure improvements, earth moving, you know, the kinds of implementation projects that are uh, sort of larger scale. I've got a photo here of the uh, culvert assessment in the Sawk Hill as one example of implementation projects might be culvert right sizing and replacement or green infrastructure for stormwater management. So watershed groups are often volunteer organizations with small budgets and they may lack the jurisdiction to implement large projects. And so I went in with sort of an assumption that watershed groups might be implementing some of these projects. And what we heard was that they play a number of different roles to support Im implementation, like watershed planning to line up projects, providing education on opportunities, making sure that uh, municipalities and other entities are connected with the right grant resources that they know about these opportunities and they also play an important role to build support for moving some of these projects forward but they may not be directly involved with actually doing the implementation themselves given their small budgets lower capacity volunteer roles so then it's really important for watershed groups to develop partnerships with municipalities and soil and water conservation districts and larger nonprofits to move some of these important implementation projects forward. And what we heard was that capacity, communication, and a lack of clarity on roles and goals can be barriers to developing these partnerships. So watershed groups need to be, uh, and other partners need to be really clear on exactly what their mission is and their goals for particular work might be, the roles that they can play, you know, who's doing what, making sure that, that these partnerships are really supporting each other and being able to communicate all of that. And of course, we heard about the need for funding as a barrier as well for implementation, uh, and, and particularly from the folks from municipalities that we heard, uh, that we spoke with, um, there's a real need for infrastructure improvements and funding for flood mitigation projects, improving septic systems, wastewater infrastructure, and drinking water systems. We also heard about the need for funding for capacity building, uh, both generally, but also specific to implementation projects. So there was a need for staff and operations to actually manage infrastructure 
uh, projects, implementation projects, see these projects through, make sure there's on ongoing maintenance. Uh, some of those can be real challenges. And uh, these groups, municipalities, soil and water conservation districts, regional nonprofits, and watershed groups um, could, could use funding for staff and operations as well to support these projects going into the ground. So here's a quote that I think highlights this really well. So that's the other major next step is identifying a lot of money because it's going to take a lot of money. It's not something you're going to be able to do with a volunteer group or without a serious project and really offering people money to fix them and giving them support or giving municipalities some sort of way to support their residents and getting them checked and or repaired. I think this person was talking about septic systems here in this case. Um, and I think this is a good example of we need funding to do the implementation project, but also we need the funding for capacity and staff to be able to manage that project. I was also really interested and surprised to hear about some emerging watershed issues that groups are really concerned with. So in the, our section on, on watershed issues, our most frequently cited issues and concerns within the watersheds were flooding, drinking water contamination and source water protection, and emerging contaminants and PFAS. Groups also talked about many different water quality concerns. That was, uh, to me, a little bit more expected and less of a surprise. Um, but, but many groups are really concerned about flooding, drinking water, and emerging contaminants. And these are really big problems. And these are problems that are of, of a scale, of a magnitude that can be really challenging for community-based volunteer groups to take on. And so a challenge is defining the right role for groups so that they can really work towards these, these high priority issues in their watershed. And they may not align with some groups' traditional activities or roles. So it may require sort of rethinking this. Um, of, of course, some groups are working on flooding. I've got a photo here of uh, Moodna Creek flooding in Washingtonville. The Moodna Creek Watershed Council has been doing great work to implement stream gauges to identify flooding and connecting directly with uh, real-time emergency management response to let municipalities know if there is a flood event uh, to alert residents. And so again, this is not to say that all watershed groups are not doing this work, um, but it might be a different role than some, some of the other groups have been playing. And so I think there are some opportunities for partnerships with municipalities on this issue on these issues, particularly with some of the opportunities around drinking water source protection, like the drinking water source protection program that New York State offers, climate smart communities, which many municipalities are working on, there may be opportunities for watershed groups to play a role in moving some of that work forward. And then also the watershed scale flood studies that are going on through Resilient New York and, and other programs. So uh, another quote on, on these emerging issues. Uh, so we as a watershed group have not touched on that kind of stuff. We decided when we did the watershed plan that we weren't going to talk about the PCBs because there wasn't a ton we could do about it. And I think that's really what it comes down to for us as a coalition. I don't know if we see ourselves in a role with the PFAS and that kind of stuff, or we just haven't found how we could be helpful. I guess we wouldn't be opposed to being helpful, but I don't know how we could be. Another thing that we heard from groups was around scale and really wanting to right size their work. And particularly in large watersheds, there's a scale challenge uh, working at the local level versus across the entire watershed. Um, and, and then also thinking about the scale at which some of these issues need to be resolved. So in summary, uh, the Hudson River Watershed Alliance's new watershed needs assessment shares what we heard from 56 Hudson River watershed group leaders and regional partners on challenges, needs, barriers, strengths, and accomplishments of watershed groups. We've posted it on the Hudson River Watershed Alliance website. I'll put the links uh, into the chat when I'm done sharing my screen. And we really encourage you to use it. So, so this is available for everyone to take a look at. Um, it might give you ideas to structure programs, particularly if you're working at the regional level. Um, there might be some programming ideas that, that to support watershed groups that you can glean from this. Uh, learning from the strengths and accomplishments, I think, is a really great opportunity 
opportunity here, particularly if you're a watershed group and you want to understand uh, what other groups are doing well, it might give some inspiration. We'd love to see this project justify grant applications. So we heard so much about these different funding needs. We really tried to document everything. And so there might be grant applications where you can, can justify this need, that it's not just your local need, it's, it's across the board here. Um, I know that the New York State Water Resource Institute research grants recently asked if there's any documentation of the research need. And, and so the needs assessment might be a great place to cite some research needs as well. And another opportunity, I think, is to consider new partnerships. So for the people in, in the Zoom room today, um, if you're part of a watershed group, this might be very familiar to you. If you're not, it might be new. And I, I encourage you to think about what skills, expertise, what talents you have that might be able to support watershed groups and thinking about how with, with such limited capacity across the board, we can start to build some of these partnerships to make the most of, of different group strengths and different groups, areas of expertise to really make a difference here. So as I mentioned, watershed groups have diverse structures, roles, needs, and strengths. This is not a one size fits all. Um, and some needs are common for all types of organizations, while some really are more specific to watershed work. We really heard across the board how key collaboration is. Again, with limited capacity, we think that we could um, be doing more with less by building in more collaborations that are really um, have effective communication, have clear goals um, for groups to be working together on different projects. And so I think there's opportunities across the board, uh, but thinking in particular about technical expertise implementation projects and tackling some of these complex emerging issues. So again, there is a need to clearly define roles and goals for successful partnerships, and also a need to communicate mission and priorities and making sure that watershed groups and other partners really are clear about, about the work that they're doing. There's a need for funding, implementation projects, infrastructure improvements, capacity building, staff and operations. And again, I think there's a really a particular opportunity here for municipalities and watershed groups to collaborate and leverage their various strengths and resources. So I think that watershed groups can really be helping municipalities with a lot of the things that they're working on and vice versa. I think there's a lot of common ground um, and, and we can build some really effective partnerships here. So again, I encourage you to take a look at the watershed needs assessment if you haven't already, and also the work on watersheds report. Those are both on our website. And again, both part of this larger project, really two sides of the same coin in thinking about challenges, barriers, needs, along with strengths and accomplishments. So in terms of Hudson River Watershed Alliance's next steps, we will be incorporating our findings from the needs assessment into our new strategic plan. We are in the midst of it right now, and we're working on wrapping that up in the next couple of months. And we're thinking about how to develop programs and technical assistance to meet the needs. Some of the things that we heard that are particularly in our wheelhouse was an interest in regional collaborative projects. So watershed groups working with other watershed groups on larger scale work, it could be a communication campaign, campaign. It could be um, some kind of a regional project with shared methods. Uh, so we heard that in a bunch of different forms. So looking into pursuing that. We also heard from groups about the value of information sharing and networks, both regionally and locally. So we heard from watershed groups about the value of sharing information across watershed groups, lessons learned, strategies, um, and making sure that that we hear about case studies and, and what happens next. So not only what happens when an exciting new project goes in the ground, but what happens five years later, is it still working? Would you still recommend that approach? And we also heard from our regional partners how important it is for them to know uh, from each other who are, are providing certain technical assistance, what kinds of new programs are out there. You know, this is a very dynamic space and there's lots of new opportunities. And so there's, you know, we heard that there's real value in information sharing and networks that the Hudson River Watershed Alliance supports, which is great. We also heard some specific training needs, uh, and so we can incorporate those into our existing programs. 
And, and we don't have to wait to do this. We are already incorporating some of the lessons learned into our programs. We conducted these interviews in 2019 and early 2020, and we were able to use a lot of the lessons learned to frame both our 2020 and our 2021 annual watershed conference. So uh, you might recall back in 2020, we had sessions on science communication, science partnerships and shared leadership. Those were all themes that we heard in the interviews and we wanted to get information out right away. We didn't want to wait. Uh, and then the 2021 Watershed Conference focused on watershed and strategic planning along with leadership transitions, which were also themes from our needs assessment. The Hudson River Watershed Alliance is also working on developing a series of recommendations for watershed groups and other partners. And we'll be sharing and discussing our specific findings with different audiences, uh, like county agencies. I've already spoken with the Ulster County Water Quality Coordinating Committee meeting, Water Quality Coordinating Committee um, about county roles and some of the strengths and needs around counties and would look forward to speaking with other counties as well. Um, looking to have conversations with state agencies, academic institutions, and also re regional organizations where um, we might be able to work together and, and think about how we can collectively meet some of these needs because they are so, so diverse. So before I wrap up and move to q and I just wanted to give a huge thank you to everyone who supported this project. Um, this project started in 2017 with a grant from the Hudson River Estuary Program. And so really wanna thank the, the State Hudson River Estuary Program, particularly Fran Dunwell and Scott Cuppet for your support of, of this project and watershed work in general. And thank Maureen Cunningham, who's now at the Environmental Policy Innovation Center. Maureen was the executive director of the Hudson River Watershed Alliance when this project started. Um, Michael Finewood from Pace University uh, did a huge amount of work to, to develop the methods and make sure this project really was academically rigorous and was also able to bring many of his Pace University students on board to play a role through their coursework and independent studies. And it was really a mutually beneficial uh, project to have as many students involved as, as we did. Thanks to Larissa Reed from Common Ground Consulting for assisting with some of the analysis and, and work getting to the needs assessment report. Uh, and Jessica Coonan from New York Sea Grant for some advice around focus groups methodology in particular. So thank you so much for having me this morning. And with that, I'll open up to questions, comments, surprises, uh, and conversation. Emily, that was spectacular. Thank you very much. Uh, when you scroll through chats later, you'll see that uh, some people uh, gave you great shout outs for clear presentation and really great material. So thanks for that. Um, one of the questions that has come up and I think you have largely answered is how this was funded. Uh, estuary program and some input from a couple other organizations in strategic ways. Yes. Um, yeah, great question. So this was a 2017 Hudson River Estuary Program Stewardship Grant. Um, the Hudson River Watershed Alliance received that grant and that funded the majority of this work. We also had great uh, match resources. So Michael Finewood at Pace was able to bring students in and get funding for independent studies to help move this work forward. Uh, the students did a lot of the work with the transcripts and coding and assisting with focus groups. Um, and so we actually had a, at the end of the day with volunteer and, and pace and, and other support of 50% match from the Hudson River Watershed Alliance against the uh, Estuary Programs grant funding. And given Mike's background in social science and that the findings so clearly seem to point to needs almost more heavily weighted on the organizational structure and funding side uh, and the human resource side. That, that, that sounds like a really good blend. Um, yeah, and, and like I said, I was pretty surprised that there weren't more science-focused uh, science focused needs. Uh, it was, it was, this was a surprise to me to hear the extent to which these organizational capacity building needs really came to the top. And, and of course, we've really focused in this in the report um, on the group needs themselves. But of course, the groups also talked extensively about their watersheds, their concerns, water quality, flooding, and, and some of these emerging issues as well. So it, it was sort of a mix. 
Yeah, it raises some interesting questions for us as we think about these breakfasts, for example. I mean, they, every one of them typically has been focused on a science topic. Uh, and if that, that that's obviously a need, I believe. Uh, people sign up and, and we're all here today. Um, but um, perhaps some of them should be uh, in the future focused on some of these other topics. So it's, it's fascinating information. Um, we got two two different people asking questions uh, with slightly different angles around the question of politics. Uh, we try to avoid politics as a non-advocacy group, but would it be more effective if groups as a whole advocated for better state regs, for example, or are th was there any discussion of interactions with local politics and helping or hindering their work? Yes, there was. So uh, in the needs assessment, um, we have a whole section on municipal challenges and, 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 and up uh, looking, thinking about government. And we heard from a lot of watershed groups that politics really can be a challenge, both you know, party politics, turnover of municipal officials, and so on. And so uh, while the Hudson River Watershed Alliance is a non-advocacy organization, some watershed groups are very interested in lobbying. Some groups are very interested in advocacy. And so at the local level, I think there really is an opportunity. You know, there's sort of advocacy with a, with a capital A, which I think of as, as the lobbying, and there's advocacy more with a lowercase a. You know, a lot of groups are writing letters uh, and providing support for projects, both locally and state. Um, some groups are actively lobbying, some groups are interested in doing more of that. And so certainly in thinking about scale, you know, there are some things that might be better suited to changes at a state level and, and state policy changes as opposed to local policy changes. Um, so that was definitely something that the watershed groups expressed. And it's something that we're parsing through as we look at these recommendations for you know, who might do what in terms of next steps, what some of our recommendations might be. Many towns have, a, have an active or uh, CAC, Conservation Advisory Committee, Council, I always forget what the last C is. Um, and the role is to be the eyes and ears and kind of an advisory voice to a town board, for example. Um, I'm wondering if there's, there's an analog where the watershed groups can be kind of the CAC for a watershed and speak to the municipalities in a watershed. Does, does some version of that make any sense? Yeah, and we heard a lot in, in these conversations too about opportunities for CACs and watershed groups to be partnering on different projects. What we found too is that in some places um, that don't have watershed groups, the CACs are really playing that role. And so that might be uh, you know another opportunity uh, to think about starting a watershed group there to take on more of the water resource specific work. Um, but CACs do really important work. They often are playing very similar roles to watershed groups. And so for the areas where there are both active CACs and watershed groups, there could be some real opportunities here in supporting each other's work. Yeah, the, the difference would seem just to be the geography that the, the watershed group cuts usually much, much more broadly. Uh, so that's that's cool. I've got a question about uh, whether the Watershed Alliance can help smaller groups learn about uh, grant funding and how to, how to identify opportunities and prepare applications, et cetera. Uh, that sort of fits into that administrative project element that you also spoke about. Yeah, that's definitely one of the training needs that we've identified is is grant funding. Um, you know, it, it's easy enough to send out the link, you know, in our Watershed Digest newsletter, we always have a list of opportunities and, and grants that are available. Um, but we know that it's not enough to just send that information and, and that there really is a, an art and a science to grant writing and how uh, projects are defined. Uh, one of the things that we heard um, in some of our focus group conversations was the need to uh, break longer term projects up into smaller sections so grant funders can really understand what this two year project is going to accomplish in the larger uh, project, uh, larger scheme of the project. And so yes, the Hudson River Watershed Alliance is very interested in, in putting together something on you know, preparing applications, administering, managing grants, um, we also heard about some of the administrative burdens of grant management and how challenging it can be to track everything, have reimbursement-based grants. And so I think there, there's a lot here, a lot of 
it's very interesting content and hopefully very helpful content that we'll be trying to figure out how to frame and, and put on a program. So thanks for asking about that. When I was on the board, I sometimes felt like a better name for our organization would be the Hudson uh, Watershed Tributary Association. Um, because so many of the organizations that we've worked with are focused on a tributary that flows into the Hudson or the Mohawk. Um, how much awareness was there or is there of the, of the main stem versus the tributary that a watershed association is working on? It really varied. You know, one of our watershed groups is um, the Hudson Seven Intermunicipal Council. They're working directly on the Hudson River main stem, but thinking about using a watershed approach to drinking water protection of the Hudson River. Um, you know, certainly some groups are more focused on away from the Hudson, but there also is an important nexus there as well. Yeah. It, it, the we, you and I have always debated that when we're trying to find speakers. Should we be focusing on the tributaries or should we bringing, be bringing talks about the Hudson River itself? Um, and um, but can you say a little bit more about some of the science topics that emerged? Uh, you talked about emerg emerging contaminants, flooding. Um, I didn't hear anything about uh, climate change or, or, um, or anything of that nature. Yeah, so again, some of the science needs that we heard were around water quality monitoring um, and understanding new research methodologies and understanding some of the opportunities there, um, GIS, and, and more focused in on the, the watershed concerns. So, um, you know, better understanding what how to communicate science, how to do actionable science, um, and especially, again, thinking about water quality monitoring. If we're partnering with academic institutions to do water quality monitoring, how can we get that data in the hands of decision makers and have it be used? So I don't necessarily have the, the answers to that, but we've certainly flagged that as, as a challenge, and we'll be thinking more about that. Did this needs ass assessment maybe identify some things where the assistance of research institutions could be helpful to us. Yeah, and I see that um, Woodfrog and Dry Leaves, otherwise known as, as Laura Heedy, um, has shared in the in the chat another social science study on capacity needs related to conservation in the Hudson Valley. And, and Laura, I was planning to actually include that. There have been a couple of other needs assessments in, in this region. So this particular study by Sharna Allred and, and others at Cornell focused in on municipalities and conservation and land use. Um, Shorna and her team also did a, a needs assessment of watershed groups uh, for a, an early version of a master watershed stewards program uh, many years ago. And so there is sort of this history too of these kind of assessments. And I think it'll also be really interesting to look over time at how the needs are are changing, what, the, what some new needs might be, and if we've met some of the needs over time as well. I'm seeing a, um, a reminder here also to uh, think about coordinating with the New York State Forest Action Plan folks. So um, looks like you're also screening comments here quickly too. Uh, <laughs> um, and, and there's a question that's come in right at the end. It's a little off topic, but since we have a moment, um, although not a watershed in the traditional sense, the ocean is a huge water source. Uh, there was um, a plan or there was evaluation of huge gates in the New York City area and wondering if there's any update on that question. Yeah, unfortunately, I do not know the answer to that. I'm, so I'm not aware of one. We'll, we'll stay tuned. We'll keep our ears open, but uh, I'm not I'm not sure what what that what the status no. is. Um, I see I see another question in here about larger literature about how to support the needs of watershed groups like the ones in the Hudson Valley. And uh, I should have included this as a next step. So thank you for the question. Uh, but Michael Finewood and a group of other uh, academics, particularly the uh, academics on the Hudson River Watershed Alliance board, there's a whole group of them, are, are working on next steps in terms of academic literature review and research. So this really focused on the conditions in the Hudson River watershed. When I've spoken with uh, colleagues who do this kind of work in other parts of the country, they say, yep, 
that sounds right, <laughs> that we deal with some of these very similar challenges, barriers and needs, uh, which is encouraging, um, but there are different structures and forms in other parts of the country, and this is an area of active research. And so uh, we've got actually another PACE student who's working on doing a literature review right now to better understand what else is out there, some of the other things that we might want to think about using a broader context to learn from and, and thinking outside of the Hudson River watershed and New York State. So uh, stay tuned. We're looking forward to having this um, sort of a more academic output and a, and a journal article at some point in the future as well. Yeah, is there anything more that you could say briefly in a couple, in your in our remaining minutes about the appendix to your report? Is there any are there highlights that people might want to go and look at? Yeah, I, so I would say for the appendix, if you are interested in a particular section and you need a little help navigating to it, uh, feel free to email me. I can I can get you to that spot. You know, I'm really interested if if you are interested in having a, a more in-depth conversation about this with your group, you know, like I did with Ulster County Water Quality Coordinating Committee, I pulled out where counties show up and we talked a little bit about what we heard specific to county watershed group relationships. Um, you know, I'd be happy to come in and, and have more of a conversation with other groups in a similar way. But with the appendix, you know, really encourage you to, to use the, the table of contents and the headings to navigate to the particular issue. Um, I've the people that have looked at the at the appendix have been glad they did. So don't be intimidated by its large size. Um, it in, and described it as like a conversation. And so the quotes are interspersed with with my like sort of high level analysis, here's what you're going to read in this quote, um, and then it goes through. And so if you are interested in more in depth uh, challenges related to municipalities, you know, you might want to go right to that section. If you're interested in learning, well, what are the exact funding needs that watershed groups talked about, you can go there. If you want to learn, well, what does leadership mean to these groups? Why is this such a challenge? You can really go in and, and explore what that means. So I think there's lots of room here. There's lots of content. And um, I think we're barely scratching the surface today, but I, I'm glad folks are, are so interested in this content because I really hope that this can be a foundational document for all kinds of different purposes. Great. One last question before we close. Um, we talked about the potential interactions with CACs. Are there potential overlaps with climate smart? communities task forces? Yes, absolutely. Um, and so we there were just added a number of different watershed based actions to pledge element seven of climate smart communities. And so I think there's a lot even more that watershed groups can be doing to, to coordinate with uh, climate smart communities. And actually next year, the Hudson River Watershed Alliance will be having a webinar series on some of these more water focused climate smart communities actions to go through some case studies and talk about uh, where there might be particular opportunities and sort of break down that process. So um, these actions are pretty new. We wanna give municipalities some time to work through them and get the points and, and figure out how to do it. Uh, and then we want to share those case studies so that others can learn from them. So lots of lots of great opportunity here. Fantastic. Well, Emily, this has been terrific. Uh, thank you very much for presenting all of this today. Um, I think we're at the end of our time uh, to everybody who's tuned in today. Um, thank you for sticking with us. Um, and we look forward to seeing you all next month. Great. Thanks so much, Russell. Thanks everyone for joining us and see you next month.